I will talk a little bit uh, about the background of the conference and some of the ideas and the questions that we'll pose. We have um, a lot more people signed up for the uh, for the uh, this sort of marathon session that will go all this afternoon. We'll try to um, afford you a little bit of time for breaks in between the panels. Uh, and we'll try not to talk too long, all of us, in our appointed sessions. There is a uh, program schedule that I hope that you got when you came in. Uh, and there's some slight revisions from the very vertical brochure that um, you may have had sometime uh, in advance of the symposium. Uh, we, um, there have been a couple of, of changes, one that we knew about um, far, farther in advance, which is Ian Hawksworth, um, who was coming from London and couldn't um, because of the, I think the, um, the uh, financial crisis. Uh, and so we have rearranged the program a little bit, which I think is going to be excellent because it, it will offer people who have come halfway around the world in order to talk about what they know so well a little bit more time to expose you to those ideas, as well as to have some question and answer interplay. Uh, and the, really the structure of the whole conference has been to try to bring together these comparative urbanisms of New York and Hong Kong and also the network of people of professionals in the building and design industry, um, the government officials, academics, architects, engineers, in order to talk about how they design and plan and think about um, their respective cities. Uh, and also to, to exchange how these, how these cities either relate, culturally don't relate, how they get formed, how they, how they take shape. And so with every one of the sessions, we've been trying to illustrate how Hong Kong works and then have a New York response. Um, so the other person who's not going to be able to, to be with us this afternoon is Sean Donovan, who is going to respond, the um, Commissioner of Housing Preservation and Development here in New York. Uh, and uh, he was going to respond to our, our first session, which is focusing on vertical commu communities and housing. And um, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll introduce Nick Brooke, who will, who will give that first talk, and who's been one of the co-chairs for this whole conference, along with Paul Katz. As soon as Paul arrives, he'll come and uh, say a few words and um, also uh, introduce Nick. Uh, but uh, in any case, in um, substituting for Sean Donovan um, is uh, Mark Willis, uh, a, a very experienced housing um, expert who worked in the, in the city uh, at HPD and has since been doing um, community development for almost uh, 20 years now. Um, he happens to be my husband. Uh, and he's, uh, he's, going to be, he's, he's going to fill in for the, for the um, discussion. So other than that, there are, uh, and he, he was a late addition to the program. So other than that, you can see the sort of lay of the land in the program that you have here. I'll try to remember, too, to tell you that um, all of the proceedings are going to be videotaped uh, and audio taped so that we can present them in a web posting. And the entire conference will be on the Skyscraper Museum's website. Uh, in an index format so that all of the interweaving themes um, can be explored and we will have by the end of the sessions probably more than um, eight or nine hours worth of discussion on the, on the sort of characters of, of these two um, great cities. So what I thought I would do, um, oh, after um, also thanking the people who have come so far in order our, our participants from Hong Kong to share these ideas and, and discussions with us, um, and also to mention that we're very grateful for, to uh, the MTR, and Thomas Ho is, is here, and he gave an excellent talk yesterday to explain um, the awesome proportions of the um, building projects, both infrastructure and, uh, and commercial space that the Mass Transit Railway Corporation in, in Hong Kong has created over the last um, 10 years or so in particular. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're very grateful to him for both coming and helping to support the exhibition. And also, um, Jim Robinson from Hong Kong Land has been a great supporter. And um, we'll be talking about the commercial development in Central tomorrow. Uh, but he is, and Hong Kong Land have been uh, especially helpful because they responded to my own sort of initial interest in Hong Kong, in the relationship between Hong Kong and New York, of, of being, uh, Hong Kong being a kind of um, realization of some of the prophecies of the future city that had characterized New York visionary architecture in the early 20th century. So the premise of this um, series, uh, it um, follows uh, a, um, an art of three exhibitions that the Skyscraper Museum has been exploring called Future City, 2021. 
The first of these was New York Modern, uh, which was up about six, um, for six months, of about three months ago. And um, in that show, we looked at the idea of New York as the prediction of the city of the future, of the urbanization and modernization process in New York in the early 20th century, uh, and the shift from uh, a, a, a market-driven city that was beyond, it seemed to be beyond control, it was just growing by rampant technology, to a shift in, by architects and public officials, city, not really city planners at the time, but there were urban reformers, who created um, a, a zoning law in New York that was passed in 1916, uh, and which established a, a, a real a, a new psychology about the way the city might grow. Uh, and the city took shape by that, and every building that you see in Midtown that has the wedding cake style in the Empire State Building, Jim Connors is here who manages the Empire State Building, that the great um, characteristic signature towers of New York, like Empire State and Chrysler, follow that template that's created by zoning by, by the, the city management process. Um, so that idea of a rationalized city of towers is kind of the second part of what we're going to explore in this pair of, uh, of, of days um, between this, my PowerPoint here, yesterday's topic of vertical density, um, learning from Hong Kong, where we um, took in particular the idea of the global city, of um, this Time Magazine from, uh, actually the Asian uh, edition of Time Magazine from January 2008, that looked, as you can see, um, at this, this uh, sort of alighted global city, a triad of, um, of, of financial capitals of New York, London, and, and Hong Kong, and, and posited that they were connected not only by their financial markets, but also by their character as dynamic cities. That they were places that people of power, prestige, wanted to be. They located there for a reason. So these became the winner cities. Um, but winner cities in the, in the world of global capital need to, um, to, to enter the 21st century with the infrastructure and the, the technology that, um, that serves the communities that drive that business model. Uh, and so that we looked yesterday at uh, the MTR's infrastructure of rail and transit, and especially at their transit-based development, uh, and in particular at the two buildings that you see um, here as the new iconic towers, the one in these images um, across the harbor, the IFC, International Finance Center, which is the uh, culminating structure of an interconnected commercial network series of towers a layered city of com commerce above train stations above an airport express. Um, and the building in the foreground, which is the new and as yet unopened but topped out ICC, the International Commerce Center, uh, and its surrounding buildings of Union Square, which is an MTR um, organized um, project uh, and which has uh, a number of important developers connected with it. And we, we talked yesterday uh, with uh, Julia Lau, sometimes with Kai Properties, about the genesis of, of these, these projects. So these two skyscraper icons that now are the pylons that mark the entrance to Victoria Harbor um, are nodes above the Airport Express that bring you from Norman Foster's fantastic um, airport, probably the most efficient um, in the world. And, uh, best loved by many people, especially business travelers, but which is a, a sure um, 23 minutes from uh, entering the, uh, the one-seat ride carpeted train that is only a few steps away from the gate that you roll your baggage off of as you get um, off your airplane, and um, the, the train comes every 10 or 15 minutes, and 23 minutes later you're in Central, in the very center, the heart of the business district of of Hong Kong, um, where you have a connection to a free bus that takes you to your, your hotel or to the subways that take you anywhere else in the city. That kind of dream of transit, of a rationalized transit system for New Yorkers may be many, many years off, um, but it is the model for the global financial capitals going forward, and it's a necessity, and we talked about that um, yesterday um, in general uh, with uh, Lee Sander and Chris Ward, um, the heads of the MTA, and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Uh, there's a, a view and a cutaway of um, the KPF and others' design of the multi of the base of the ICC tower and the multi-level connections of commercial um, and transit. 
uh, and an overview of this new project with its housing. Um, and, and surrounded by a zone which is yet to be completed, um, grass here in the, in the rendering, um, much more elaborate than some of the plans for this uh, West Kowloon Cultural District, which has uh, had one winner in a competition of, I think Foster uh, won the, the first round of the, uh, maybe not even the first round, but one, one of the rounds of trying to decide how this new public cultural space would be realized but ran up against some opposition uh, that we'll discuss in the course of this afternoon's uh, talk, um, along with this general idea of debating density. So today, we um, look uh, uh, less at the global city of financial capital and of international business and be get, begin to get down into the problematics of how do, how do cities work, how does density sit on the land, where do people live, what kind of concentrations work with urbanism. Um, and so we're going to ask the, t the, the question, um, what does, does, does density pay um, or, or does it cost? Um, we're going to pose a number of other questions, but just by way of illustrating for those of you who aren't familiar with Hong Kong, a, a bit of the dynamic skyline, I'll show you a series of views of Hong Kong, um, in some cases as it, it's, it's most romantic, but certainly visualizing the incredible, intense um, compaction of built environment that you see in these characteristic views, looking down, for example, from Victoria Peak past the mid-levels, which is the residential, the high end of, of residential uh, apartment towers, down into the sort of expanded zone of central, uh, and to the harbor, of course, because it's the harbors especially that New York and Hong Kong share as the genesis for their, their great um, identities uh, as colon first colonial ports that become business capitals. Uh, and these views looking from, um, looking over to the other side of the harbor to Kowloon where those 70-story uh, tall towers are encircling the Union Square District. Uh, or here from the IFC looking back, oh, back up the hillside. And so you see the contrast between the dense built environment um, and the surrounding mountainsides, which of course um, gives Hong Kong a very different character than New York, as we'll see in some aerial views in a moment, but just to give you a sense of some of the nature of the space, especially these residential districts like the mid-levels, which grew by market forces, essentially. They are controlled um, by some land management um, principles, which are much more liberal than those that we have in New York with our own zoning laws, especially the, the floor area ratio, the FAR. Uh, but you see that that kind of, of built density is something that has been created by demand. Now, this uh, the whole conference explores a, a concept which I don't think is entirely original to the Skyscraper M Museum show on vertical cities, uh, but it's something, but it's a distinction which I think is not made often enough, and that is the distinction between different kinds of density. You just saw a market-driven density where if people want to occupy and capitalize on the value of that central land. You see that, of course, in Manhattan, and, and Hong Kong is in every way Asia's Manhattan, or as we, we discussed uh, yesterday, too, maybe the reverse, that um, New York is becoming um, Asia's, uh, or New York is, beco is, is becoming the West's Hong Kong. Uh, in any case, uh, the two cities are very much alike, and one way that they're alike, notwithstanding the, the statistics you're seeing here, but looking at the pictures, the, the density of Midtown and of Manhattan, of throughout, throughout Manhattan, is very great. Uh, it averages about 70,000 people per square mile, which is um, exactly the same density if you calculate the built area of Hong Kong. Now, I'll show you a couple, some images that um, draw that, those contrasts out. Of course, we're looking at the, at the heart of Midtown and some of the densest part, uh, but we're seeing in the statistics here a density um, in kilometers here only of, of 10,000 people uh, a square kilometer, um, over I think it's about 27,000 people square mile that would be. Uh, and you see in the same, and these are taken from our exhibition, um, in the, it, by the same measure of the boundaries of Hong Kong, of the, of the city boundaries, which are really the special administrative region's boundaries, uh, and the number of people, seven million people for Hong Kong, eight and a quarter million people for, for New York, and Hong Kong is a slightly larger in its area than New York City's 
five boroughs is. If you calculate those densities, um, uh, Hong Kong seems to have a very low density of only 6,300 a square kilometer as opposed to the 10,000. Um, but the difference um, is the terrain of Hong Kong and also the land management policies. Where, as you can see, um, in this, this overall territory of Hong Kong, which in, in, includes um, the islands, various islands, and part of the mainland, is Kowloon being on the north side, and you see the dense built up area in gray, that is the high rise development, but you see so much green. The green is the mountainsides, the green is the preserved nature of country parks and also the unbuilt, most of the unbuilt area. That comprises 77% of Hong Kong um, uh, territory. Uh, in New York, if we look at Manhattan from the same distance uh, in the sky, in, uh, from in Google Earth, um, both of these, uh, oh no, this is not, excuse me, this is, this is closer in, um, in the exhibition you're seeing a, a portion of Hong Kong from the same distance in the sky, but in order to be able to see some detail in, in, in New York, uh, you can see some areas that are sort of green. We cut off below Central Park, but you can see Union Square and various squares that are, are slightly um, gray-green color. But what you see very clearly is there is no strong contrast between the nature space and the built environment. So Hong Kong's built environment, on less than a quarter of its 426 square miles, means there's 100 square miles of built area, 7 million people, 70,000 people per square mile, um, even counting those new town, new town, new territory, new towns, so that all the people of Hong Kong live at the same density as Manhattan. Um, and if we contrast the kind of density that you see, which is not vertical density, but horizontal density, and you take the world's largest cities like Cairo and Mumbai, you can see that Cairo with its 37 kilometers here, on the square kilometers, 37,000 people, or Mumbai with 21,000 people are vastly more dense statistically than Hong Kong or New York, but you need only to look at the nature of their skyline to see that it's a different kind of density. In fact, it's a density of congestion, of crowding, um, and um, as it happens with these cities too, a, a, uh, a density of poverty rather than of affluence. So we want to ask the question, what is the relationship between a density, of a vertical density, which happens to correlate with the vertical cities of Hong Kong and New York, and the kind of density which is what we usually talk about, people usually talk about, not me, but people usually talk about density as a bad thing, as a dirty word, as something to be avoided. Uh, and so that is debating of density, we wanted um, to, uh, de to deepen the discussion of over these um, three days. Uh, London it chooses to be a lower rise city and we can see that it's very low density indeed if you take its boundaries. So um, the discussion this afternoon will then focus on first housing uh, and how that works uh, and uh, Nick's, Nick Brooks uh, paper will, will talk about vertical, vertical communities, it works in Hong Kong. Uh, and so I'm just showing you a few images of those to get you in the mood and familiarize you. Still that line of the mountains and the nature space in strong contrast to the 40, 50, and 60 story towers, most of which you're seeing in, in these um, photographs of San Quano, uh, are um, private, uh, privately built, developed, built, middle class housing, built for profit, um, and uh, indeed quite profitable. Uh, and with identical towers rising above a, p a podium base of shopping and um, direct rail transit. Uh, just to show you a little variety of that and get in a little closer um, with the different views. These are um, about 52 or 54 story towers in San Quano. We are in Tung Chung, um, a new town that is uh, that essentially it was created to serve the airport community of the new airport in Lantau. These are um, new communities, indeed, many cities. And if we think of them. Um, well, in a moment. Uh, so the difference between horizontal density and vertical density is great. The similarity between New 
York and Hong Kong um, in the competition for space and the kind of density of market-driven density that you see in a slide like this um, looking towards central um, is characteristic of both Manhattan um, and, and Hong Kong. But there's also uh, a, a designing density, an intentional density, that is a different kind. Um, but it is dense. It's a vertical density, but in the, what we will look at next in, in uh, Nick Brooks' uh, illuminating talk uh, is, are, are the dynamics that create, by decision, the kind of density that makes the strong line between the nature space of the hills and the concentration of the 50 and 60 story towers of middle class housing. Um, different than the way we've done it in the States. Co-op City is the top view. Um, Taifu Shing is the, uh, is the lower view. That was one of the earliest housing estates built in the, in the late 1970s. And it's about four times, four or five times as dense. I think it's 138 people per, per acre of Co-op City, um, 755 an acre for Taifu Shing. Uh, so we will look um, to then in the, in the next series of, of talks by um, Peter Cookson Smith and, and uh, Christine Lowe and then Maggie Brook uh, at the issues of harbor and heritage uh, of urban space and, and connectivity. Uh, and this slide sort of poses the question a, a little bit in the foreground about the questions of landfill and the harbor, the reclamation, and how that space is used. And we're going to discuss that as well as the nature and the character of streets, um, how they work, streets and, and neighborhoods. Uh, and then I think, yes, and that black, uh, this black slide represents uh, both this, the more traditional streetscape and um, the people crowding the streets that didn't transfer from Flickr into my PowerPoint for some reason. So th those don't exist, even though they exist on my computer, they don't exist here. Uh, and we'll go back to that one as evoking um, some of the uh, character of the separated streets, the streets in the air, that we'll talk a lot more about um, in the um, architect's talks and the, and the theory and practice that is tomorrow's session. So is Paul here? Yeah. There he is. Come on up.